So good morning and welcome to the 28th Military Rider Symposium. My name is Dr. Travis Morris and I have the honor and privilege of being the Executive Director for the Symposium and also the Director for the Peace and War Center. So for those in the room, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And for those that are joining us virtually, we also welcome you wherever you are attending from and we're glad that you are with us. So this is day two. Yesterday we had an absolute fantastic day and a, a heartfelt thanks to our esteemed guests that uh, spoke in the panel last night, which many of you attended, but also sessions throughout the day. And much thanks to also our moderators and, and students that participated um, yesterday. So why are we here? The symposium exists over the past 28 years to discuss security challenges that we face in the 21st century. For the students in the room, like I said, many of you attended last night, but the difference between sometimes myself and some of the other faculty or staff or alumni in the room, you're gonna be the ones that are gonna be leading us through some of these challenges over the course of your career. Whether it's in the military or in law enforcement, maybe in the political arena, or working for an NGO, what we're talking about over these next two days or today and yesterday, this is your world. And some of the applications we're talking about are military, in focus or security in focus, but, but AI is, is something that's already shaping our lives and it's something that's happening incredibly quick and when things happen rapidly, sometimes it takes detours down pathways that we don't know, we don't expect, or we underestimate. So that's why we've been doing this for 28 years, is we wanna take some time just to pause, bring in people from around the globe that have spent some time thinking about these particular areas and as you can see from the program, over the past two days, we're talking about artificial intelligence and the nexus between robotics. But last year, we looked at what was going on in the Arctic. We, before that, we looked at wep the weaponization of water and how water serves as a, as a catalyst between conflict, sometimes uh, violent extremist organizations and, uh, and governments. And this year, we wanna just pause and align the symposium with the president's vision looking at artificial intelligence and what that means for us in the future. So you can see on the screen that Dr. Lyle Goldstein is gonna be talking about an incredibly important topic. And I, I, I must say that we are thrilled that he's back with us. He was here for our, our Russian summit and we're glad that he's back. Also just wanna say that when we're talking about artificial intelligence and robotics, we're having this conversation here in English in the United States. That's important, but it's also important to know that this isn't just an English-centric conversation. I've said yesterday in some of the sessions that these same conversations are being had in Chinese, in Arabic, in Russian, in Korean, in German. We're talking about a subject that is being discussed by some of the sharpest minds around the globe. I have no idea your familiarity with this topic. I have no idea if you've thought about the intersection of AI and robotics in your own life and what that means for the future. But if you're thinking about serving in the military, in any branch, this is something that's part of your life that's already existing and moving ahead. I mentioned the international component because one of the things we do here at Norwich is one, we want to internationalize in every area, that includes cyber. But we also wanna bring our students into every aspect of the events that we do and give them a voice. So before I introduce Dr. Lyle Goldstein, we'd like to have a student come forward, Yo Kambawamuse from Ghana, and he is gonna give us a short reflection, both in his native language and then in English, about his thoughts about uh, technology, artificial intelligence, and, and security. So York, why don't you come on front, and the floor is, is yours, okay? Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, my topic is technology in the dimension of warfare. So first, I'm going to read in my native language, then I'm going to move on to English. So here it is. In Fijuma did you mati to war near a fe a kumubano? In Fijuma and our Kodia a crown or day, did you mark no other wedding pea, sir? It's a missus or kunuma or day. 
etuwa Europa fo de di juma wa kudi wo diti Africa ne America fo anka sanyi nemu atum atopaya wo de di juma wo wi asuku mienu enyi na ye senior okobetimi aye ne efa ba ko ho ara efi juma ho nimde a ekron wo nhweso ahoro abako some de ne di se asrafo obetimi di efi juma ne munyo ma fofro aka won akudi ho nyina nyamfa so kese chen won fefu no na so enye efi juma ho ho nim de nkuto na ema wodi nkunim okunyi nim ye emuye den a efa ohoro pi na so de ofa ba ko djuma e ka se e be fimu aba no ho asem wo kwan a e ko achi so a unim hwe nfi djuma tum pon bra a sese de en sese ne cheche a e ye den boa ne bra wa cheche unu huna mu ye na wo de djuma ho en sese ye esi wo nkuto mo ma ye hwe jeme ni wo wi ase komienu wo wi ase komienu nfi se ase no na ma ya wa ya pam di jemeni enim akwansin pi wo april ne nwishen ahodo ahoden nsum na wo di jemeni enim wo nfidjuma ho nimde mu na so wo 1940 mu no jemeni di nkunuma etelsin biara wo ni ye kudi hu ba ko bo na momaye ni dan akwan hora hitler asrafo no mpenifo no fa so no edi nkunimi na apam no asrafo dom ne dodo no awa asrafo wonam fam na wonam fam bro na woni pipe mu biara na so german fo akode hihye pipe mu ansa na wo kono roba wo hihye akode akuye a wo hihye se ebro so a atamfo no hu dwire wo na so ayonko fo ne hwete won april ahodo ne hwete aku ahoro Senior Maya Wapam no and to me and for one in Fijum Mahunim de and shall one as I for one out for him ye die de say one at the say. A Maya Wakabum no ye a palm no far, Jinabia, a bema one Wabo or Humbine, when to me and share or quine bea a bema were dee to me or in Fijumanu or dee. A year and yes, war one one a chess and ye. E bia enfujuma ho nimde wintumi nye adwuma yi bra a won fa nhehe e bia mo ama no wo ko a enko so da ana se afrafra mu te se ira ko ne mu no enye bre ni na na enfujujuma mu nimde ekron a wodi nkuni ma asrafo na woni kwan a wo susu ye ho yi abrabo pa ni asetra ho adesua e fa ho ra wo de kutia atamfo ka ho Okono buta ya hodo wo de di juma wo okwan a efata so na won hwe so bra okwan kese no susie sika sem tebie abrabo pa ni asetra mu tebia ewo atamfo ni nipa dodo mu no ho wa fe 2003 mu no america ni na yonko fo she iraq so one year wo friend Iraq onu mi enu na bote etitiru ni se Saddam Hussein abanu egu na wa ma Iraq enya ahofede no okono fa a wo di kono ye ni ebi imaye da in kabom ni nyina nkoso wo ahohora her kese mu de mind wo inframa hehe wo chere kese na ema wo ntimi yi nyo ma wo di si e won ni so ntintem no aye adwuma yie wosan kunim bia ho ye na echi na okuna echi fa ahoro no ye abasantun ensusu wi ahoro awodi ko apam no hihye no ho beda edi se enye no kre wo fa so ni rako fo no be ma won akwa aba se ahofedi fo ni won no won di won ngu so wo de ese no asan acheche won aba no na so na eyi nye sa etuete bi sere bre a opam no no afache ti abi na ma okono che na e ma ni pam 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 pi hwe won kwa na enfijujuma aboa apam no ma waji rak na so entimi mu ni asetere no amfa won kuta Etinye bia ni ho se enfidjuma hunim de na ma okonu yekesi 
Esese a quanche for near sa from penny for the home in she say. No one a quine horror. Now so, name fast or horror that a quine or fast so a day mubre. Now will ye fee a quine or fast so ye de one same. Now will bunny say a ditty thrower and ma will deem cunim no come. Senior wonder near the abacosum no. Near here say a precious shame for so if you do you my war so. Or quire or fast year, Jumano. Namu Eddie, Juma, or a quire a quanche no etu pro. Send ye who are back as soon in Namuno. Why in Fiji Juma who named the awful for Biara? And ne unmanned under sea vehicles. Watchina, who mu a sa for and she say a horror a quenimo. Say yes, I could ye are, as a sea busa must say. O quire now, quine bear able to me. The same for you may assay and could you move. I may So now I'm going to read it in English. Technology plays a vital role in the outcome of war. The use of superior technology or weapons has proved repeatedly in its ability to shape the combat dynamic. The use of rifles by the Europeans in the wars against both African and American natives the use of atomic bomb in World War II. All of these are examples of how a war can be one-sided when there is a presence of superior technology. History has shown that armies that could integrate innovative technology into their warfare have had a significant advantage over their counterparts. However, technology is not the only determining factor for victory. War is complex and multidimensional and using one dimension to generalize the outcome is ill-informed. Technology is only informed or effective when supported by robust organizational structures and doctrine, and when the threat is well-defined and a working strategy established. We'll look at some historical examples to prove this point. Let's just take a look at Germany in World War II. At the start of World War II, the Allies were miles ahead of Germany in terms of number and quality of tanks and air power. They were ahead of Germany technology-wise. However, in 1940, Germany won one of the most expensive victories in modern warfare. This victory was achieved by the revolutionary tactics that the generals of Hitler adopted. Most of the Allied forces had slow-moving infantry and no divisions. The Germans, however, created armor divisions before the war. They created organized tactical teams as combined armed teams with air support and tanks, which gave them speed and the ability to surprise the enemy with overwhelming force. The Allies, however, scattered their tanks for the support of infantry with no proper division into tank units or divisions. The inability of the Allies to effectively integrate their technology in their infantry proved to be their undoing. Even though, in the end, the grand strategy of the German people led them to their defeat. In the start, it was a very good plan. The Allies took a defensive stance and could not draft a strategy that would ensure they manifested their power of the technology at the start of the war. This is a classic example of how technology might not be effective when unsupported by strategy. In irregular or hybrid warfare, such as the Iraq War, Technological superiority does not always guarantee victory if the armies do not have a well-conceived strategy, including moral, sociological aspects against enemies. The strategic objectives of the war falter when the grand strategy does not consider the economic situation, the morale, and the sociological state of the adversary's population. In 2003, the United States and its allies invaded Iraq in what is known as the Iraq War today. The main objective was to overthrow the Saddam Hussein government and liberate the people of Iraq. The combat phase of the war was unprecedented. The coalition advanced at a high speed with the help of their guided air systems. They had technology that drastically reduced their sensor to shooter cycle, allowing them to take out targets swiftly and efficiently. Despite these successes, the post-conflict phases were disappointing. The assumptions integrated into the strategy of the coalition turned out to be inaccurate. They assumed the Iraqi people would work on them as liberators and rebuild their governments using their oil reserves. However, 
This was not the case. An insurgency occurred shortly after the occupation by the coalition and protracted the war, leading to the loss of thousands of lives. Technology has helped the coalition take over Iraq, but I could not account for the social dimension of warfare. There is no doubt that technology increases force on the battlefield exponentially. Strategists and military commanders need to involve them in their plans and strategies as much as possible. However, embedded fits lie at a tactical level, and when it is taken from the context of strategy and regarded as the main reason for victory in war, as shown in history, it is almost never a good idea. As shown in history, what is needed is to analyze the strategic advantages of technology and use it in the world's direction and purpose. As we have seen throughout history, new technologies are being developed daily. Today, unmanned undersea vehicles in China. Tomorrow, advanced space military systems. When we develop these weapons, we must ask ourselves, what is the best way or method we can use them? And how can we integrate it into our battle strategy to ensure victory? Thank you. Thank you very much, York. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lyle Goldstein. And uh, for his bio, you can read that in the program, but I just want to highlight something that we're very proud of. You can see his uh, affiliations. He's the Director of Asian Engagement, Defense Priorities, visiting Professor Brown University, but this one we're very proud of, that he's a senior research fellow at Norwich University. So Dr. Goldstein, welcome back to Norwich. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks, everyone. It's a thrill to be back in Norwich. I've, I've uh, come to realize that, um, uh, that Norwich is, is one of the foremost places to discuss strategy, so I'm, I'm glad to be here again. And, uh, and uh, this is a tremendous conference. I'm learning so much. I appreciate the uh, remarks uh, from our, our student from, from Ghana. That's, I had a best friend in college who spent a year in Ghana and, and swore that th these were the nicest people on earth, and uh, so I, I'm I'm taking that under advisement still and planning to get there. Um, uh, this may strike you as a bit of a strange topic. Um, maybe, you know, I know that Norwich has a very close tie with the U.S. Army, as it should, and um, I do appreciate the chance to discuss uh, some kind of rather esoteric points in naval strategy, but I do think that uh, th these are worth uh, thinking about very carefully. Um, uh, it's essential that, that uh, you know, people in the Army have some uh, understanding of naval strategy, just as people in the Navy need to absolutely have some understanding of, uh, of uh, land combat. Um, uh, so I think, I think this is uh, well proven in the Ukraine war. I'll, I'll mention a few things about that conflict, but, uh, you know, we, we can imagine that uh, a lot of what's going on in Ukraine is powerfully impacted what's going on in the Black Sea and vice versa. So, so thank you for your attention to this topic today. I, I, uh, let me say that one of the, uh, some of the issues that are, uh, you know, just to follow up on last night's conversation that, that strike me as very important. One is that while drones have absolutely proven themselves uh, in the air, you know, we, we all know that unmanned aircraft, uh, you know, quadcopters and, and the like are incredibly powerful tools. Uh, that's, we don't really uh, know that that's the case for undersea vehicles. Uh, so the question is out there. Uh, and this uh, effort at research is a uh, start on trying to understand that issue, uh, where this might be going. Uh, but let me start, say at the outset that, you know, if we may have a question mark over this. Um, I would also say, just reflecting on, on what I heard yesterday, that I think uh, Sharon Weinberger raised the absolutely pivotal point that um, this technology is not really new, although it feels very new. But, uh, you know, a lot of this, these technologies even were, uh, you know, people started to work seriously on them during the Vietnam War. And I recalled uh, a moment from travels in China when I was in Beijing at the newly, um, uh, newly uh, modernized uh, Chinese military museum in Beijing, and I urge you all to go there when you get a chance. Uh, it's quite enlightening. But in there, you will see an American drone uh, from the Vietnam era. And it's quite striking to see that, uh, to understand that China got hold of this and has studied it thoroughly. And, and 
I think that may, when you begin to understand uh, that China started this work, you know, decades and decades ago, um, we will not be so surprised by how far they're progressing. So um, let me make a, just a few more introductory remarks here, if you'll permit. Um, I do, uh, I was here for the Russia conference, which was fantastic in, in March, and uh, I do read Russian, and I'm very uh, concerned about this, but Russia is an undersea power, absolutely, and um, that will impact how China goes about becoming an undersea power, so uh, we better keep our eye on that. Here, uh, I've got a little pointer here, but you can see the, uh, this picture showed up on the Russian internet recently, a, a uh, you know, Western drone uh, off the coast of uh, Crimea. Here's some discussion of the um, a new American drone that they're taking seriously. Here's an, an article uh, written by a, Ru a Russian military strategist about the, um, about the pipeline uh, sabotage. Uh, so that's, uh, th that will come up again in my remarks, but uh, we haven't talked about that much, but that's a, maybe an interesting use of AI. But, um, Let's, uh, last time I was here, I was talking about Russia-China relations, and I'll be down at Naval Academy in a couple of weeks talking about that same topic. Uh, it's an absolutely crucial topic. What are the lessons that China is, is drawing from the Ukraine war? And here, I just want to uh, highlight that there are a lot of lessons that China is learning uh, pertaining to ground combat, and I am putting a lot of this material together. I have a big pile on my desk, and I would love to come back to Norwich and, and share the results of, of some of that research, um, if there's an opportunity for that. Uh, now, um, China is already absolutely a drone superpower. Uh, they control, I think, something like 90% uh, of the commercial market. Think about that, folks. Uh, so we shouldn't be too surprised when we see uh, vehicles like this, now, this, is a, this is a Chinese Navy drone, which is quite interesting. It's clearly not uh, going off the deck of a ship. Um, so what's it doing? I see a lot of uh, ordnance. Uh, looks like a, some kind of ground attack vehicle. Looks, let's face it, this is likely uh, to play a premier role in a Taiwan scenario, uh, delivering some of that firepower to the beach. Um, and yes, China has uh, amphibious combat on the brain. And none of you are surprised by that. This was just the other day. Um, they were talking about some amphibious exercises. So it, we shouldn't be at all surprised that China is thinking very hard how to drone support uh, amphibious operations. Uh, for example, blowing through obstacles. In fact, uh, sorry, my scan is not very good here. But uh, here's a unmanned vehicle, not an undersea vehicle, vehicle but a, what we call a USV, an unmanned surface vehicle, uh, that would be primarily for the purpose of blowing through obstacles on a beach. And uh, I, I, while I'm focusing on undersea vehicles, I do want to highlight that China's um, prowess on both um, uh, UAVs and USVs, that is the unmanned surface vehicles, uh, could be incredibly important. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't want to downplay that at all. We'll come back to that. And here's, here's just another bit of evidence here. This is just, uh, I tweeted this out just the other day, uh, an article on a, uh, in sea trials for a 100-ton uh, catamaran uh, USV that looks to be a, a definitely more than a surveillance vehicle. This is a combat vehicle for sure. Um, now, why is China obsessed with naval uh, unmanned systems? Um, it's not too hard to figure this out, and I'll give some more uh, detailed explanations later. But as a summary here, uh, look at these uh, nice capital ships here. Uh, this is just from, from the other day on Chinese military news, Type 075. You want to protect these things. You're going to go all out to protect these things. They're expensive. Here's a nice uh, cruiser that uh, I was mentioning yesterday in the panel, Type 055. But beyond that, China is very worried about our submarine force. And here's an article from their Navy magazine discussing, uh, you know, you can see just how closely this is uh, talking about the launch of a new uh, US Navy uh, nuclear submarine. This, this is probably. This is definitely up there on their chief concerns about the US military. So they're going to use drones to defeat these. That's what they're going to try to do. But also, I, I'm amazed how much intention you'll find on Chinese news about the sabotage of the Baltic pipeline. And maybe that's not surprising. China is, a, you know, is building infrastructure all over the world. So they're very disturbed at the destruction of this kind of infrastructure. And uh, one can imagine that drones will be a key part of protecting uh, undersea infrastructure. Um, 
China's effort in uh, developing ocean technology is, uh, is stunning in its uh, scope. Uh, I think, I must say, I think it's at least as uh, broad and deep as our own effort, and I'm, you know, I'm very well acquainted. Naval War College is next to the Naval Undersea Warfare Center, so I know how much brain power we put at it. I think China is trying to equal that. Um, you know, you can see a lot of uh, just what we'd expect here, but you'll see often the word uh, in Chinese, mu biao, means uh, targeting, and you can bet that undersea targeting is uh, very high up on their list. I'll, I'll, I'll walk through more methodically what I think their sort of evolving doctrine for these undersea vehicles might be. But uh, let's, let's look at the um, discussion of uh, Captain Li Jie, retired. I got to spend a day with this uh, Chinese naval theorist in Beijing uh, uh, not too long ago, well, well before the pandemic. But um, he had some interesting ideas um, in this article that he put out. You can see. Uh, you know, he, he views this as a game changer kind of capability. Uh, a focus on mines here, I think we better be attuned to that. That has been highlighted as a major vulnerability of the U.S. Navy. Um, and a big intelligence role. In fact, the, the words he used, or the editors anyway, used in this title is sha uh, shou jian. That means like an assassin's mace weapon. Uh, in English, we would say like a silver bullet kind of uh, uh, capability. Um, we know that this has gotten high-level attention. This is a 2018 picture from Hainan. Um, that, that's a big thing in China when Xi Jinping comes to uh, look over your technology. And, uh, but I, I want to say, you look, China does come from rather humble origins in this respect. And I would say, you know, prior to 1990, uh, China probably had uh, close to zero capability on this. Well, how did they go from zero to 60 so fast? It's a bit of a mystery, but this is partially explained by this photograph, actually, and, and uh, some description I read in this interesting book on UVs. And uh, the explanation, CR, what does CR stand for? I think is a good case to be made. It stands for China-Russia. And actually, this is a Russian vehicle that went out basically on a Chinese expedition. And basically, China from what I understand from this series of expeditions, the Chinese basically downloaded decades of Russian expertise on undersea vehicles. Now, the good news is Russia was not as advanced as the US on undersea vehicles, so that's the good news. The bad news is China did succeed in going from zero to 60, or at least zero to 55, and uh, that explains a lot of how they have gotten so good in this area so fast. And uh, indeed, we're seeing some really cutting edge developments. Um, here you see uh, this is um, uh, a, um, a, a drone that works by uh, using buoyancy. So it doesn't have any other kind of propulsion, but it, it is able to uh, travel at almost, uh, with almost unlimited range, which is extraordinary. But there are other extraordinary things about this. It's called a glider. We have them too. Uh, but gliders are, this one is from Tianjin University, not too far from Beijing, but this, these gliders, uh, one of their features is because they have no uh, propulsion other than buoyancy, well, they go slowly, but they're also uh, almost silent, which is, uh, as you know, uh, acoustics are everything in undersea warfare. So this is actually becomes a potent system. And the fact that uh, this particular glider has gone down to uh, 8,000 meters is quite incredible and uh, actually um, means that uh, this kind of system, which may seem a little bit primitive, but it has, uh, I, I understand from uh, researchers at Woods Hole, one of the premier oceanographic institutions in the United States, that this uh, kind of technology has great potential for anti-submarine warfare. So, in other words, for tracking our submarines. Uh, and here you can see some more evidence just how widely this is a different kind of glider. But you can see uh, China's expeditions, and this shows actually tracks of these gliders. Uh, but you can see they wielding whole fleets of gliders uh, on some of these scientific expeditions. And I'll come back to the import of some of these gliders, but I also want to highlight, I, I noted your last uh, year's symposium was about the Arctic, and I'm really sorry I missed that because I have a very um, deep interest in the Arctic. In fact, if all goes well, I'll be in China discussing Arctic policy uh, about two months from now. But um, look at this. You have... This should look familiar. This is American territory, right? There's the Bering Strait. Here's Chinese operation of gliders 
right in that area. Um, I wonder if we even knew about this. I, I credit my uh, colleague from Naval War College, Ryan Martinson, who, who discovered this, but that's pretty amazing that uh, they were operating research gliders right in the Bering Strait. Um, but China has uh, moved methodically on, these, um, on this technology, and uh, like I said last night, where the U.S. Navy has also deployed um, drones to find mines, um, it, it's an exceedingly important, that is mine warfare. Just as mine warfare and ground combat is, is, is essential to understand and prepare diligently for the same with uh, uh, ocean combat. And indeed for China, especially as we talk about Taiwan scenarios, uh, this is an incredibly important mission. So the fact that they're building up their capabilities here should be no surprise. And indeed there have been a number of new uh, mine mine sweepers, mine hunters, and they will be wielding uh, UUVs for sure. Um, you know, I can just click through a series of other uh, UUVs. It's, I mean, one of the amazing things about this topic, and this is one thing you'll find with China, that China is quite open. If you go on the websites of Chinese universities, you can learn about these systems. They're often bragging about their capabilities. Why? Well, it's partly because China is a, a commercial superpower, and a lot of this has major commercial applications. You can probably buy one of these if you wanted to. Uh, maybe we should. Um, but, uh, you know, they have uh, uh, major ocean trade fairs where this stuff is marketed. Uh, and, but you can see that at least for the small size UUVs, this is becoming uh, rather, you know, uh, rather commonplace. Um, now, when we get to somewhat larger UUVs, this, this is uh, one you can notice it looks a heck of a lot like a torpedo. There's no, you know, our, ours do too, often because that is kind of an optimized uh, design, but also one can imagine that these deploy very easily out of torpedo tubes, and indeed, one of the major uses of, of UUVs uh, is to operate together in tandem with submarines, for example, going in, char uh, 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 navigating through a minefield. You can imagine that's pretty important work. Um, but it's not just, they don't just look like torpedoes, right? Look at this one, and it looks pretty, in a way, this is, you know, looks almost, give you a good laugh. But uh, I think this is quite for real. Uh, we don't want to um, downplay the seriousness of this. This is a trend, actually, in Chinese uh, weapons design, also in U.S. weapons design, to go toward bionic, that is to, to kind of copy from the uh, natural world, from the animal kingdom. Uh, this shouldn't be surprising at all, but I mean, you know, I read this article very carefully, and if these capabilities uh, have anything to do with reality, and I think they do, then, then we should be quite worried about this uh, in terms of the speed parameters. And, and w this article outlines how uh, this will have small, medium, and large, each of them with uh, differentiated functions. Uh, uh, you can imagine the large one is sort of the, the um, call it the uh, headquarters unit that commands the, the smaller ones some of which are surveillance and some of which are attack units. Um, but uh, we, we have begun to see uh, some of these platforms, you know, these look more kind of research oriented. They could be uh, also uh, useful as targets uh, to practice on for sure. Um, this one, very large, 10 meters or so. Uh, I don't even have the name of this vehicle, so some of these are harder to divine. And, you know, I, I, I discovered about 100 discrete prototypes in my research on this subject, I don't pretend that's nearly the whole universe. I would say that's just the tip of the iceberg. And of course, a lot of China's work on this is secret. Um, here's another hint of uh, coming attractions. This one is uh, about 20 meters. It seems to have torpedo tubes, so it seems to be a combat UUV. Uh, the periscope is not telescoping, it's, it's just sort of folding. Uh, but that's one of the virtues of this technology, is that it's not, uh, it's not in, in effect, it's not rocket science, uh, which makes it quite realizable. Um, and there is good evidence now that China is on the cusp of wielding a force of robot um, submarines. Uh, now, I would say we, we are also on the cusp of that, so, you know, that should make, scratch your head and see, think about where this rivalry is going, but uh, I do recommend, um, this article, I think, is incredibly important. And my study suggests that the claims made in this article, chiefly by scientists at the Shenyang Institute of Autom Automation, are very credible. And uh, so if you're interested in this topic, please uh, Google this from the South China Morning Post. There's quite a lot of inf good information in, in English, which is great. Um, 
but let, let's talk in a little more detail about what, how, how does China see uh, using these things? You know, oceanography, well, that should be plain. But here, I would say that you've got to realize China has been a disadvantage in oceanography for a long time, right? We've been doing this for decades, our, our oceanographic ships going out, you know, often from universities, you know, University of Washington, University of Rhode Island, University of New Hampshire, going out and collecting huge amounts of data uh, in the world's oceans. China has not, so they're playing catch up to some respect, uh, that's true. Um, ISR, everybody knows what that means. Uh, this, these characters are important though. Shui uh, Xia, Chang Teng, this, is, this means like the undersea great wall. And this is a, a true uh, a project that I think uh, Xi Jinping has taken direct interest in. And we have good evidence, I'll show it in a second, that to suggest that they are literally trying to build an undersea great wall, which would be a you know, system of systems under the sea that would allow a, a very good detection of uh, uh, foreign submarines you know, proximate to China. That's not an easy task. Those waters are, are very difficult. They're also, though, quite shallow, which you know does uh, have some advantages in, in many ways. So, will uh, you know this to me is a uh, massive project, uh, largely dependent on UVs, although not entirely. I mean, you you can also have a buoy, for example. It doesn't move, but it also has incredibly important sensors and and plays a, a vital role. Uh, you know, some of these other. Um, Goals you can you can think are, are you could surmise yourself are very important. Uh, you know, communications relay. A, this is incredibly important too. Port security. China. Is, I'll get into this more in a second. And I've talked about undersea warfare for sure. Uh, but also, it's not just uh, kind of in a defensive way. It could also be uh, you know an adjunct to submarine warfare. Uh, mine warfare. Don't neglect it. We constantly have neglected this at our peril. Um, that is the U.S. Navy. I mean, let's face it, mine warfare is not sexy. I don't think in land warfare either. You know, who wants to be a sapper? It's incredibly important. And we've seen that in Ukraine, of course. Um, and by the way, sea mines have also played a role in Ukraine. If you haven't realized it, there may be a good reason why Odessa has not yet been invaded. Um, we can get into that in Q&A if you're interested. That's a very important aspect of the war there. But... Um, and I talked about support for amphibious operations. I, I don't want to over... Um, Stress this nuclear delivery, you know, we don't have any concrete evidence that China is pursuing this, but Russia is pursuing it. I mentioned it last night. I'll show you a slide that shows you that China is quite, ha, has an interest as well. Um, yeah, I mentioned the undersea gray wall. So you can, here's some evidence for that. Uh, and indeed, uh, in fact, I, meant, I, I think August Cole left, but I used some of his, uh, his colleagues' work, Peter Singer here, um, good work to, to show that this is in fact uh, something that is very real. And here's some additional evidence for it. I found, you know, evidence for three discrete tests. And I think, you know, of all the slides I'm showing, this may be, uh, to my estimate, one of the most fascinating, because what, what are these things? Look at these things. So we've got three different tests. They, and by the way, China has learned from us, you need to compete these tests. What are these? Well, you plugged in your cell phone last night, right? So did I. That's what these are. These are plug-in stations for UUVs. And if you're building an undersea great wall, you better have a lot of those out there, okay? Because you want them on station and ready, constantly monitoring China's waters for adversary submarines. Or, by the way, you know, in the, you know, even out to the, beyond the first island chain. So this, I think, is very critical uh, benchmark in showing how China is advancing its effort uh, in building that undersea great wall. But the, they're going beyond just, you know, kind of simple, Detection technologies, look at this UV, and I, I read this article carefully. It shows that this is, this is an operational program. Okay, this, this is a UUV that doesn't just go under the water. It starts above the water. It then goes under the water. It then comes back out and maybe attacks a radar. Think about that, folks. That's a whole different uh, way of thinking about uh, cross-domain combat. And we may, our guys may, you know, our people out there may face this. Uh, it's a concern. Uh, I did mention the nuclear issue, and I just wanted to highlight that this is not the only article I found where the Chinese are hotly discussing this. Um, again, we don't want to exaggerate the threat here. I, obviously, if Russia were to use this, uh, Russia would be destroyed by our nuclear arsenal, which remains strong. But I bring it up, though, because this does have, this does have an important operational um, rationale. 
That is, if, 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 you're, if you're, all you think about all day is how to defeat American missile defenses, boy, this looks like a pretty useful system. And China is very worried about U.S. missile defenses. Okay, but you know, even as we talk about these more complicated platforms, let's not neglect the simple. The most simplest use of these UUVs may be just patrolling like a fish outside of a uh, American base and noting that a submarine just went by. You know, that could be a huge, uh, a huge uh, tactical and operational value. Um, and, and just want to highlight before I close up here that um, undersea combat is much more than, than um, just UUVs. It it's this, uh, involves all these domains, and I, I am quite concerned that China putting a full front effort at anti-submarine warfare, that our submarines will be threatened by Chinese uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles as well, and that, that technology is definitely in development. There is a major commercial side to what China is doing. They are very interested in undersea mining. Uh, this is for real. Uh, this is not just a cover. Uh, by the way, they've been doing this near Hawaii, which is interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think they could be ahead of us in this area. Um, that's, that could be a concern. But th th they aim to wreak immense profits by mining the seabed. Um, okay, uh, just in my uh, just last few minutes here, let me talk about a couple of scenarios that concern me. Um, this, you know, when we talk about the gray zone, that kind of non-combat or pre-combat area, uh, drones could play a big role. You know, you, you can snatch a drone, and I'll get into that in a minute. In fact, that's already happened. Uh, but uh, you can also um, brandish drones in a crisis. Say, by the way, you didn't know we have drones off your ports. Let's show you. You know, they could do that, um, and that could suddenly have to change our tactics, you know? Uh, what if a Chinese drone shows up in the Atlantic, in, you know, off of Norfolk suddenly? I mean, that would radically change how the U.S. Navy does business. It hasn't happened yet, but it, it might happen. Um, I, we talked, we've talked a little bit about this one. I, I am concerned about that. I mean, drones are getting ever more complex, and we, we're working on combat drones. They're working on combat drones. I think one of the speakers at the panel last night said, probably we'll, we'll stop right at the edge before we uh, get these ready for, uh, for true, uh, as true combat platforms. I don't, I don't know, and I don't know that China will stop. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, this, like, when we consider China, we also have to think in terms of geoeconomics. This is a geopolitical power. They're interested in strategy, of course. But as some, uh, one of the good uh, students last night who approached me said, look, China's really interested in making money. Well, there's a lot to that, and a lot of what I'm showing here today can be explained by that, that, that China is a, um, you know, they, they may not aim to conquer the world, but to simply buy the world, and they, a lot of this technology, and by the way, a huge um, boost to U.S. Um, technology development in the undersea and just globally was the uh, 2010 BP oil spill in the Gulf, where you had dozens of drones working constantly to shut off that uh, that oil spilling into the, uh, into the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So uh, the commercial and military overlap here is simply huge, and that's true in the Chinese case as well. I am concerned that preemption, um, you know, if we're talking about U.S.-China rivalry, we're talking about two nuclear powers going to war. I mean, you know, I don't want to be too extreme, but in, one, in the darkest scenario, we have Chinese drones off of, you know, Kings Bay, where our or, or off of uh, Puget Sound, where some of our, uh, you know, nu nuclear-armed submarines are, um, you know, do, is this the future we want? This, we may be hurling toward this future, um, and that may have to radically change how we do business. And um, this enhanced bastion scenario I've, I've been thinking about is, is a more defensive use of drones here, and we can imagine that China um, you know, as it builds its undersea Great Wall and so forth, that really is kind of thinking in terms of these uh, rings of, of um, geostrategic power and uh, that most of this is, is and, and there is a geographic component to drones that I don't think we've really discussed enough. But um, as for transparent oceans, drone, more cheap sensors out in the ocean are going to make the oceans more transparent. This could be a major problem for the U.S. Navy because we rely so heavily on our submarine uh, strength. That really is the, the, I would say, the sharpest spear in the, the U.S. Navy's uh, toolbox. So uh, um, this, is, 
this is quite a dark future if, if the incredible value and um, advantage we possess uh, in nuclear submarines uh, starts to go away because they can now be um, are more easily revealed. And finally, uh, this leapfrog scenario, you can guess what that is, but there's evidence uh, that I've revealed where Chinese strategists say, hey, China is not, does not have the same prowess in submarines, right? They haven't been doing it the way we have for 100 years, but um, can China leapfrog over that capability with unmanned systems? Um, I mentioned that gray zone scenario. This did occur uh, in January 2016. Um, oh, sorry, December 2016. You had this incident where they took one of our, uh, it was a glider. Uh, they did give it back, so that's encouraging. But I don't doubt for a minute that this was a, that Beijing had looked at its, this is right after the phone call between uh, Tsai Ing-wen and uh, uh, Canada, candidate-elect Trump, uh, and that's, this is what they elected to do. That's very interesting that they decided to employ a drone snatch in that way. So it's something we might want to talk about, how uh, drones um, can play and that it can be part of the crisis there. And, and it's not the only crisis, right? There was another uh, crisis where Iran shot down one of our drones. Uh, well, just a, a few parting shots here. You know, I think this picture is quite interesting, but this has become very uh, fashionable in China to hold these competitions where students gather at a pool and start you know, playing around. But uh, we do a lot of this too. They learned it from us. Uh, but yes, the, the, a new generation of Chinese uh, strategists and engineers is, is putting a lot of effort at this. Um, and um, also wanted to just highlight this article in Dang Dai Haijun, which I think really points at something you know, very disturbing here, that um, they may use drones to get at the very deep ocean. You know, most military operations, oh, there's my timer saying, I better wind up. So most military operations take place in the, in the, you know, not in the really deep depths of the ocean, but China is kind of saying they can have an advantage by going deep, which is quite interesting. And uh, really, if you read some of these quotes, quite unnerving here, you see, Talking about deep sea uh, robot squadrons and this ability to achieve surprise and to use the hydrographic terrain of the ocean floor. I mean, this could get really um, problematic. This is a, a kind of whole new approach to thinking about naval warfare. So, you know, we better keep this in mind, folks. And this is something that AI, a way that AI can transform a naval warfare. Um, you know, I, here, here was the graphic, actually, that was part of that article. And, of, of course, this seems like a complete stretch, but actually China has, uh, in fact, Xi Jinping has put his own imprint on a project to build a uh, undersea uh, base, they called it, uh, below at something like crazy, like 8,000 meters or something, if you can imagine that. Um, so, so this is, uh, you know, th this should not be dismissed. Um, and just a uh, final thought is um, I just published this article in, uh, in Nikkei Asia about uh, drone, this drone competition. I do think there are some avenues for uh, um, still for cooperation, uh, for considering crisis management, arms control. So I, I think that has to be on the agenda. We, you know, we need smart people like you folks to help uh, chart some of this out, um, lest we we caught in that uh, robot war that we um, have been talking about a lot. But thank you so much for your time and attention and uh, happy to take some questions. And, and you, you see my contact info. Uh, I am tweeting almost every day on this kind of stuff um, and not just on China, but also on, on Russia. And um, would, if you email me, I will, I will try uh, my best to you know, answer questions and like to stay in touch with you. I hope to see you again at Norwich. But thank you. Let's give a round of applause. So, Dr. Grolstein, thank you for your very illuminating, I must say, I, I, I assume it's for you, a, a presentation. Now it's time for a q and I can open us up with a, with a question if someone doesn't have one that's pressing right now. But if you do have a question, you can come down on this side and come down on this side. And I expect that there should be quite a few questions from, from the audience. But I'll, I'll, I'll start us off. So one of the slides that you had looked at the, the cooperation between China and Russia. And 
I, I would argue right now that when we're looking at the war in, in Ukraine and Russia, this, is, this eclipses a lot of our attention. I mean, we're, we're focused on sort of the kinetic exchange between Russia and Ukrainian forces and, and our proxy equipment that's being, that's being sent there. A concern would be the relationship between China and Russia, particularly in, in this area. And this is not something that's, that, that unless you go digging for it, it's covered in the media. It's something that's almost absolute uh, blacked out. It's not something that's discussed, but your presentation illuminates it's something that we should be thinking about. But also knowing that you're fluent in what's going on with Russia, would you be able to, to speak about any information that you found about China and, and Russian cooperation to this day? And do you think that what's going on in Ukraine even pushes more cooperation, more emphasis on China and Russia going uh, further in research, maybe collaboration or training and testing in, in this particular area? Yeah, thank, thanks so much. Uh, uh, as you know, um, Russia-China relations are, are uh, something that I spend a lot of time on. I'm, I'm writing a book on the subject, and uh, indeed the military aspect of it, which I've, I've written about in, in Norwich's very fine journal, um, is, uh, is absolutely essential. And, and yeah, I mean, the, the quick answer is, is yes, yes, yes. Um, and it's not, uh, there's a lot of things that go on between Russia and China that we have no, um, no window into. I mean, for example, just if you looked, you, you, you could find online um, an enormous amount of space cooperation, which, you know, gets a mention very occasionally. But these, uh, Russia and China are planning to go to the moon together, folks. I mean, that is, you know, <laughs> it's a moonshot, right? Um, that's not a small thing uh, at all and China will reap huge gains from the experience of Russia's space program by doing that kind of very intensive work. Well, I would argue um, that you are seeing uh, almost something close to that elaborate on the uh, undersea side. That is, China knows very, look, they know very well that Russia has had its issues undersea, right? I mean, just already, in, even in 2019, China, uh, Russia had a pretty serious submarine accident, Lasharik, up in the Barents, so I mean, it's, they, they know that Russia is not your, um, how to put it, your model uh, undersea power. On the other hand, they also know that Russia has done some extraordinary things, including inventing the, uh, what's a key platform for our Navy today, which is the, uh, you know, the SSBN, the, the uh, nuclear armed um, uh, submarine, which, you know, this is a submarine that can destroy countries. That was a Russian idea originally. So we copied it and we, we did it better than they did, but it was their idea. So this kind of, you know, I call it design engineering prowess that Russia has, if we marry that with a lot of strengths that China has, particularly in kind of, China is very good at, at uh, big programs and kind of the, the manufacturing side and, and kind of tweaking systems to get them right. Russia is not good at that. So when you put these together, I mean, uh, just to give you another example where this could be a major breakthrough technology for China, they look at our F-35B, maybe you're familiar, that's a very innovative uh, fighter aircraft uh, vertical takeoff, right? Maybe you've seen them coming off the decks. Well, does China want that? Sure, sure does. Um, and I understand they already have a, uh, a, a, a Yak-141, which was the Russia's vertical takeoff jet. And indeed, uh, F-35 itself, F-35B, borrows actually from that aircraft, that original um, uh, Soviet era aircraft. So I don't think it's outlandish at all to expect that we will see China uh, put forward probably several prototypes of vertical takeoff aircraft, and those will have deep, deep Russian origins, as a lot of uh, Chinese equipment does. So, I mean, I'm very concerned about this. And the last thing I'll say here is China, hmm, look, China, I think, has used a reasonable amount of restraint. Uh, in reacting to the Ukraine crisis, that is, although they have, you know, uh, rhetorically supported Russia, they, we have not seen, you know, legions of Chinese tanks. We haven't seen a Chinese airborne division in Donbass. Uh, I don't expect to see any of that, and I don't want to see any of that. But it's not crazy to think that that could be in the, in the cards. If things get much worse between the U.S. and China, um, then China could throw its lot deeper in with Russia. I think there's a lot going on behind closed doors that have hinted at, a lot we don't know about, but let's hope that it doesn't come to that level. Uh, that would be a kind of 
I call that sort of back to the 1950s kind of very tight relationship, but I'm concerned about it. Thank you. Hi, so my name is Isabel. I'm majoring in computer science. And my question is, how will these underwater vehicles affect regular people and ecosystems? Because we've seen how drone strikes, although targeted, have a lot of collateral damage in the civilian area. Well, it's a fantastic question, and I'm so glad to see uh, uh, students that are really attuned to environmental issues, because I do think that's a chief, uh, it should be really foremost in all of our minds. Um, and I would urge you to look at a recent New York Times article that talks a lot about this undersea mining and uh, what might be some of the environmental consequences. Um, when I said China, I mean, China, um, is, you know, has, has um, a huge economy. I would argue it's, in my view, it is larger than the U.S. economy, really. Uh, uh, but that comes with it a lot of uh, um, environmental issues, let's say, and we're well aware, you know, we had a, our speaker from Ghana might be able to tell us that in, in Africa, for example, there's been a, environmental problems with, uh, Chinese activities. So I think one of the most important things, uh, there was actually another big article about Chinese activities in terms of uh, uh, fishing in the, in, across the globe's oceans. They're, they're not in other countries' waters. They're in international waters, so it's all legal and it's unregulated, but yet the environmental consequences are very considerable. Um, so I guess the biggest thing I would say with regard to unmanned uh, undersea vehicles is, I mean, I, I think they have played somewhat of a positive role Right, I mean, think of the BP spill in 2010. That was an environmental disaster. We have to give these little uh, robots credit for they, they were absolutely critical in shutting off that spill. So, you know, I think we should all be, as Americans, quite thankful for the role they've been playing. They also play a huge role in, in oceanography and, and understanding the oceans and some of the damage to the oceans is critical to um, and, and U, UUVs are playing a, a very important role there too. But I, 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 you know, I think you're probably right that we, you know, maybe this is a great uh, issue for a paper, student paper. But I mean, let's also think about uh, the consequences. You know, whether UUVs have been have been found in fishing nets, and and but if we're using the oceans much more intensively, uh, putting down undersea networks, for example, um, you know, that that's going to create. Um, environmental problems, um, I, I, but I think the biggest issue by far, and I won't even mention, you know, a nuclear armed, nuclear powered UUV, which is what Russia is doing, should disturb all of us. I mean, and this is a doomsday weapon that is, is created to, to uh, um, um, develop a, a tsunami-like impact, <laughs> which, you know, if you think of what, what a tsunami hitting the, uh, Eastern seaboard of the United States, that's what Russia has in mind. And I mean, you know, it, it, it goes without saying that that, uh, you know, should, should be condemned by, uh, you know, all people and environmentalists also. Um, but I, the thing I worry most about is this undersea mining. And we better keep a real watch on that because that could have a, a major impact. It, it also holds great promise, you know, for electric vehicles and so forth, you know, lithium and so forth. But we need to, we need to watch that really carefully. Great question. Thank you. So we have time for one more question, but this is what we're going to do. We're, we're going to ask uh, everybody, no, you can stay there, stay there. We're going to ask everyone that's lined up here and over there to ask your question, and you can choose which question you'd like to, to answer, just so that we can hear all the questions that people have. So Great go ahead. Um, what's your name? You're leaving. <laughs> we wanted to hear your question. So go ahead, Alex, and then we'll just hand the mic up, and then you can choose which question you'd like to, to answer, but I think it's important just the audience here what questions that uh, we have before you. Um, as a somewhat reluctant optimist, can I ask you about the issue of detente? How can we avoid these doomsday scenarios best? How can we invest energy and time into avoiding this seemingly inevitable global superpower conflict? What can we do right now to limit this escalation? So you were, you were saying, you know, sometimes, you know, the Chinese are developing this technology sort of out of sight, 
Um, and sometimes the unintended consequence of an arms race is discovery in other areas. If they are going to deep sea places that we've not, you know, looked at before, do you think that any science or marine biology studies that the Chinese might be producing could tell us um, if they are in unexplored areas of the ocean and give us a view into um, sort of what they're developing? Hi. Um, so I was wondering about how you talked about how like Russia and China share technology and how uh, China has been able to progress really quickly with UVs. I was wondering how, as a America, how we should defend our technology from espionage, from other adversaries, and how we should um, conduct uh, researching in the future. Good morning. I wanted to ask you about what you would think the development of arms control regime to prevent a escalatory arms race between China and the U.S., for example, would look like in the future decade or multi-decade sphere. So that's a nice flavor of questions for you. So your, your choice. Yeah, boy, all excellent questions. So I hope I'll, I'll discuss with the questioners afterward because I would like to answer them all. But um, let me focus on the first and last one, if you don't mind. Uh, on the arms control, uh, I think it's, I mean, just one simple, it seems to me this is a completely basic proposal that has not been, um, to my knowledge, has, has never been seriously discussed. But I mean, as we're, like I said, the, the most worrisome scenario is that both sides will develop drones that now hunt down our, the most um, uh, important part of our nuclear deterrent, which is, uh, I'll say with little pride, the, the Navy part of it. Um, you know, don't, don't believe those Air Force guys. The, the Navy, uh, the naval uh, uh, part of our nuclear deterrent is, um, you know, the most robust, the most secure, and um, uh, we need to maintain that, uh, and because that supports uh, strategic stability, you know, we could talk for a long time about why that's the case. Um, but to me, we, um, if we have these drones patrolling outside, like I said, outside of Puget Sound, out, off of Kings Bay in Georgia, we're in a whole new ball game. Suddenly, those submarines become um, much more vulnerable. We don't want to go there, so of course we, you know, we're not going to trust the other side. Uh, we have to do our due diligence, and that's up to you, a lot of you students to make sure, but we also have to, uh, it seems to me we could come into an agreement with both Russia and China that we are not going to make those very uh, destabilizing deployments. Uh, and finally, um, um, the, the question about the ton, it's, it seems to me, is very fundamental, and, and hopefully people are keeping this in mind. I wrote a 2015 book advocating for, you know, kind of explaining how a U.S.-China uh, detente uh, would look like, but I, I must say I think it starts with a decent amount of, uh, you see this word up here, uh, restraint. Uh, that's something uh, defense priorities is dedicated to, realism and restraint, uh, but I think that word needs to be kind of up uh, foremost in our vocabulary as we think about strategy with China. I mean, the truth is the United States is in an incredibly strong position, right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, robust society and economy, uh, allies all over the world, um, you know, uh, nobody, you know, is talking seriously about a, you know, a Chinese invasion of the United States or something like that. So w let's keep that in mind. We're an incredibly strong and secure country, and, and we can afford to act with restraint. And uh, uh, as I put it in my book in 2015, we, we can take some risks for peace. The natural instinct of great powers is to compete in a massive way and to, you know, this naturally can become destabilizing, but thoughtful people enlightened strategists will realize that we have to take some measures to, to act with restraint. We, we, we want to see some Chinese restraint, but I think we can, uh, in that way, we can move forward and reach that detente, which is absolutely critical. And by the way, I, I will note, I don't think it's been said at the forum, but this is the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Read that history, folks, and reflect on, on John Kennedy's restraint, which prevented the, probably the most dangerous moment in world history from destroying us all. So, thank you. Excellent. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. And also, you'll notice the program. We have a gap between now and the next session, and Dr. Holstein will be around. So if you do have questions or you would just like to speak with him or discuss matters further, he'll be around and would welcome 
your engagement. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience.